Well, hello there. And this is Auntie. And we are here to solve a crime. Or at least to give our opinion about it. Let me give you some of the facts. At 7 a.m. on May 14th, 1999, Dr. William B. Guthrie, a Presbyterian minister, called 911 for emergency assistance. Sharon, his wife of 30 years, lay naked and unconscious in the bathtub. The first persons to respond found her face down in the empty tub. Guthrie was on his hands and knees, sobbing and asking for help. Two EMTs pulled her out and moved her to a nearby hallway to perform CPR. In their efforts, they became soaked with water. After the ambulance left, Bonnie Dolch, who had assisted in attempts to resuscitate Sharon, offered to take Guthrie to the hospital. She helped him put on his shoes and socks. Sharon regained some heart activity in the emergency room, but never breathed on her own and never recovered any brain function. She expired on May 15, 1999, at age 34. So, let's get started. Shall we? Yes, we shall. Everybody needs a sweet old auntie. Everybody needs with a whoop whoop and a boop boop. Auntie that's mine. You can make this up. Now you know that these are some crazy motherfuckers. So why? Well, welcome back, everybody, and this is Auntie. If this is your first time being here, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And to all of my new subscribers, thank you all so much for joining the family. And to all of my nieces and nephews who have been here with me for the long haul, thank you all so much for your continued support. You all, we have gathered here together to um, solve a dispute between two sisters about the um, possible murder, okay, if you will, <laughs> of our dear Sharon Guthrie, um, done by her, uh, or allegedly um, done by her husband, Bill Guthrie. Okay, now these this couple is extremely interesting, and so are the sisters. So this is um, episode one, season one of Bad Blood. Um, it is on Discovery Plus, and we will be doing these um, at least every two weeks, I'm hoping, um, where we will be coming together as a group to... Um, handle a dispute on whether or not the facts of this case um, should be should have been questioned, right? Um, and what sister is right and what sister is wrong. So I gave you all a podcast the other day. I'm hoping that you all had an opportunity to listen to it where we discuss the facts of the case. Um, I gave some of the clinical um, details and the like. And so while we'll go through some of that, we will not go through all of that. We are actually here to um, settle the dispute between the two sisters. Now, now the Guffreys had three children, 
All right. And they um, were a Presbyterian family. He was a um, pastor. OK. Living in South Dakota at the time. Let me make sure that I'm right about that. Let me put my glasses on. OK. So you can see. OK. <laughs> Okay, so he was a preacher who was living in um, South Dakota, all right? And he was the pastor of a church. And um, while he was pastoring in the church, allegedly he began to have an affair with one of the parishioners, if you will, um, of that congregation. Once it was discovered that he was, you know, allegedly having this affair, he was asked to leave the church. And so he took his family, packed them up, and they left. And um, during this time period, he was with his wife, Sharon, of 30 years. And Sharon was, you know, over the time period, getting old and everything, it was, you know, a little obese, okay? And so the, this turned him off. Now, Pastor Bill Guthrie had a daughter who was seemingly his favorite by the name of Jenna Lou. And so I'm going to bring up Jenna Lou's picture for you all. Okay, let's check out Jenna Lou. So Jenna Lou was her daddy's favorite. She was the cream of the crop to her daddy. She indicated that her father, you know, was her biggest cheerleader and that he, you know, cheerleaded her all through life. And there were things that her father would talk to her about and tell her about. And one of the things that he talked to her about was the fact that um, he had been having a, an affair. He indicated that she indicated that he was having this affair with this woman, but he was regretful that he had talked to Sharon about it and Sharon forgave him. But dead people can't talk and confirm <laughs> or deny anything. And so this is the um, the impression that she had of her father. She was what we would call a daddy's girl. And anything and everything that her father did, she absolutely supported him in that. Okay. Now, that did not sit right with her sister, Suzanne. Suzanne was what we call a mama's girl. She was with her mom, Sharon, all the time. And she um, is one of the people, one of the key people who helped assisted who, who helped to assist the prosecutors in bringing forth a conviction, allegedly. So now there are many facts that have come out in this case um, about um, our dear, beloved Sharon. Okay, so let's go back to them. Okay, let's go back. So, of course, the Guthries were the typical family, right? They, you know, of course, would, you know, like I said, growing up in church and all of that kind of stuff. Can y'all see? Oh, can y'all see all the little babies? Now, there is a, um, a third sister by the name of Danielle who chose not to go on any of these shows, right? <laughs> she decided that she was going to keep her mouth quiet about the situation. All right. Now, allegedly, there had been multiple things that Bill had indicated happened. Bill, when asked about um, um, the, the incident at the home, Bill, of course, called 911 and said that his wife was in the tub. Allegedly, Bill had taken the water out of the tub, right? I'm just making sure y'all see Sharon. Okay. <laughs> so Bill had taken the water out of the tub. He called 911 and he said that he attempted to pull her from the tub. However, witnesses who were on the scene, you know, the nosy neighbors, indicated that his clothes 
were dry. Now, also, when they pulled him on to, um, or when they took him to the hospital, he had to put on his shoes and his socks, which were not wet. Now, Bill also indicated that when he got up in the morning, um, he said that, you know, his wife was asleep. And that he went out of the house, went next door to do his morning prayers. When he came back, there was water rushing down the stairs, according to him. And um, he, he, you know, then called 911. Now, the story has changed multiple times, although Jenna Lou, daddy's girl, indicates that her father's story stayed the same the whole entire time. Never changed. However, neighbors, the detective, and Suzanne, and Jenna Lou all had different stories from the father about minutes after he found his wife. Stay with me. <laughs> Now, according to, to everyone, you know, they thought they took her to the hospital and they pumped her, her, you know, of course, taking some blood. Because she was still alive when they took the blood, the forensic scientists were able to test that blood to find out what she actually had in her system. Now, according to forensic scientists, it is harder to detect what blood was in the, in the body um, if they are already deceased, but luckily she was still alive when the nurse practitioner or the RN, if you will, or the LPN, if you will, or whoever was on duty that night, went in to take the blood from her. They found three different drugs um, that were in her system. Okay. Now, I am not looking at comments. So I'm just, you know, I'm going on a roll, y'all. So I cannot look at comments, right? So if you send me a super chat or something like that, I am not going to see it. I am so sorry, okay? I'm so sorry. I want to put that out there ahead of time. If you send me a super chat, I will not be able to see it. But you absolutely can cash at me. And my moderators can put that in the um, description box for your convenience. Okay. So if you want me to see it, please make sure that you cash at me moderators. If you could put that in, um, to the, the chat, I would appreciate it. Okay. All right. So there were two medicines that were, uh, prescribed to our dear Sharon. Okay. Zazepan, Nipotran, and some more. But there was another bottle that was not prescribed to her, which is tam tamazepan, but it was prescribed to her husband. See, according to Jenna Lou, okay, now Jenna Lou, keep up. Jenna Lou is the what, y'all? She is the daddy's girl. Her mother suffered from depression and was taking pills. Now, according to the court document, there is no record, no record whatsoever from any doctor, okay, not even a veterinary, okay, that she was on any kind of medicine. Although Jenna Lou recalls that there was an incident where her mother had overdosed on, I mean, on Benadryl. Now, how you overdose on Benadryl, I don't know, but according to Jenna Lou, her mother overdosed at one point in her life on Benadryl. Suzanne indicated that she never heard anything like this. Now, Suzanne, of course, as we all know, was the mama's daughter. So surely if anything was going on psycholog psychologically or mentally with her mother, wouldn't the daughter have known? 
that these things were happening with her mother. Now, Sharon did have her issues because Sharon, number one, had found out that her husband was cheating on her. Her husband of 30 years was cheating on her with the parishioner. And she also was fighting with her way. Now, we all fight with our way. You know, we up one day, we down one day. We want to, you know, get things cut, snipped, and tucked. And, you know, we, we all go through that, all right? Some women more so than others. But her husband continued to rag on her and to criticize her, allegedly, because of her way. So this was something that she was battling. She had went to her daughter Susan's wedding um, a couple of years before, and she was fat, and something happened at the wedding and all of that. And Jenna Lou was due to get married two weeks before the passing of her mother. So they say. So anyway, the two, so the, so, so the, the, they take the blood and they find the temazepam in her bloodstream. But this was never prescribed to her. Now, daddy-o, oh, daddy-o, was prescribed temazepam. As a matter of fact, two weeks prior to, no, three, four days prior to his wife's passing, he had filled a prescription for temazepam. He called the doctor's office and told the doctor that his he lost his prescription and they immediately called him in another one at the Kmart. And then one day after that, he calls in yet another prescription. And so at this point, he now has, okay, doses and doses of Temazepam. Now, every day, Sharon would get up and she would drink her hot chocolate. Now, of course, when we find the temazepam, guess where it is? Allegedly, they believe that she put it in her um, hot chocolate. Now, temazepam is a medicine that comes in a capsule. The capsule can be twist open. It comes into a powdery, it's a powdery substance, and it can be put in something. The two medicines that were prescribed to Sharon, which were very low doses of what, um, I'm take, 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 take that out, take that out. Um, Yazil, can you take the JJ comment out for me, please? Thank you. Can you take that out? I don't want to say the words. Can you take that comment out? Moderators. No worries. Yeah, I don't want that in here. I don't want YouTube coming after me for that. I'm believing even though I see it on this side that it's gone. Okay, thank you, boo. <laughs> we got to be real careful. Okay, we got to be real careful. All right, because I know you mean no harm. So anyway, she the one, the medicine that she had, which was a very small dosage, um, was not enough to do anything to her. However, the temazepam that was found in um her body in her system was enough to render someone unconscious. One of the detectives on the scene um b believed that or had a philosophy that or thought that um what happened was he had given her her hot chocolate before he went to um, the church next door to pray. And when he came back, she was unconscious. They believed that or he took her at that point, put her in the bathtub, okay, and began to run the water and allowed her, because of her unconsciousness, to drown. 
That's what they believed. Now, Bill told Jenna Lou that he, again, he had been having an affair that he talked to his wife about it and she forgave him. But he talked to Sharon, I mean, Suzanne about it and told Suzanne that he had told her and that he was ready to divorce her. See, in my opinion, I believe that he was playing both of them. Now, Jenna Lou said that her father would cry and cry and cry about how much he was in love with his wife. But then he would tell Suzanne how much he despised his wife and her weight. Now, the mistress that Bill was dating, okay, was living in the old town where he was the former, okay, Presbyterian preacher. Now, Bill would often say that he was suffering from being impotent. Is that the word for it? Yeah. He couldn't, you know, get that thing to rise up and pledge allegiance to nothing. Okay. Let alone, you know what I mean. So he indicated that he was impotent and that he was going to the doctor in his old town in order to... um go through therapy and, and get all kinds of medicines and all of that. However, his mistress said that all they did was to do dang. Okay. She said, as a matter of fact, they did it so much. They would stay in hotels the whole entire weekend that he was there. Allegedly, even the church was paying for him to go back and forth to the doctor's. I guess it was Dr. Love. <laughs> okay. But she grew tired of being with him because she would have to be in the hotel with him. And because it was such a small town, she could not, you know, they could not even go out to even eat. They would have to order in back in the day. Okay. Wasn't that many stores doing delivery back up in them days. Okay. But anyway, she said he never had any problem getting it up for her. She said, that's all he was doing was getting it up and putting it down, boo. <laughs> that's all he was doing. So a lot of people believe that the reason why this incident or murder, if you will, happened was because Bill knew that if he had divorced Sharon, that he could not remain a pastor. And this was his income. This is what he's done all his life. Here's what we're trying to help the sisters with. So Suzanne, during the tr during the time the, of the investigation, got a telephone call from one of the lead detectives on the case, who indicated that they believed that her mother was it was not a the S word, but in in term it, they believe it was actually a homicide. And so they asked Suzanne to wear a wire and to have a conversation with her father to see if she could get any information out of him. Suzanne said that she was just nervous as hell, and she was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. What I don't want to hear my father say is he did it. But Suzanne agreed to work with the prosecution office, um, the prosecutors, if you will, and wear a wire. So there's a conversation that she has with her father and she says, dad, I'm on your side. I don't want to believe what, what they said about you. They got a lot of evidence on me. Just tell me. And Bill said, what do you believe that I did? She said, I believe that I can fly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she said, I believe that there's something funny going on. They got a lot of stuff on you. And I want you to tell me on whether or not you did this. Dad, were you having an affair? He said no. Although he had already confessed to Jenna Lou at the time that he was indeed having an affair, that he did indeed talk to Sharon, and that he and that Sharon had forgiven him. He had also told um no, one of the nosy neighbors. That used to keep Sharon's kids told her, girl, come over here. I got something I got to tell you. Girl, your dad having an affair. 
Now, you know, the woman at the church that your mama ain't never like, honey, she ain't never liked her, honey, because they was having an affair behind your mama back and your mama found out about it. Now, uh, you know, uh, allegedly your daddy ain't having an affair anymore, but he sure been traveling back and forth to this doctor. Doctor, feel good. Okay. So anyway, she decides to wear a wire, and this is when um, Suzanne and Jenna Lou bump heads because she felt like you never set up your father. You never go against the family. She, Suzanne said that she did this because she was like, you know what? I needed to protect mom. And at the time, I truly believed that my father had done this. Now, allegedly, there was a suicide note that was left. OK, and, and in that note, it there, there was no signature. Let me put my glasses on so I can read that some of that to you. OK. OK, she said, what happened to the girlfriend? The girlfriend broke up with him because she had gotten tired of him coming to town and doing the dang dang with her at the hotel. And he was not planning. He was not. He, he kept indicating, thank you for asking me that, Tosh. I do need to close that circle up, don't I? Thank you, boo. About the time you acting, okay, you all here, you know, got yourself together, Tasha. Hey, boo. <laughs> so anyway, what happened to the girlfriend? The girlfriend got tired of him indicating that he was going to divorce Sharon, and he never did. She moved on in her life and said that she's not going to be a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, for Bill, any for Pastor Bill anymore, or Reverend Bill, or whatever you call him. She said that if he ever decided that um, he was going to divorce her and really divorce her, put the paperwork in, she said, hurry up this way again. Ooh, ooh. I love you. Hurry up this way again. Okay. <laughs> that's what she said. All righty. So anyway, that's what happened to the girlfriend. She got the hell up out of Dodge because she was tired of him. Now, allegedly, let me go to this spot where it is. Okay. So after the state rested, the defense counsel unveiled a S note. Guthrie had given it to his attorney in mid-June. Now, do you all remember what day she passed? Okay, keep that in mind. Despite, despite a reciprocal discovery order, counsel did not disclose this note because he explained to the judge the next day it had been given to him in confidence and he was not authorized to release it until yesterday at the time he received it. Council believed that the document, okay, um, will partially eliminate the client because they couldn't find the source of the document. It did not occur to council to have the note examined for fingerprints at the time it was presented until they read a newspaper article in the Madison Daily Leader in late December of 1999. Okay. Now, Guthrie took the stand for the limited purpose of explaining how he found the note. He said this. He said he discovered it in his church office on June 10th, three weeks after Sharon was gone. It was written by Sharon, he said, and placed in a book that Sharon and I used for preparing bulletins. He told no one but his attorney and a fellow minister in confidence. Now, Jenna Lou, here's the interesting part of what Jenna Lou believes. They had a forensic scientist to do a fingerprint test on the note. Neither the husband's fingerprint was on it, Jenna Lou's, and they could not find fingerprints on Sharon because Sharon, even during her autopsy, had never been fingerprinted. The family exhumed the body to take her back to Nebraska, where she was originally from, okay, where he was having his little rendezvous. And at that time, when they exhumed her, they then took a fingerprint check of Sharon. Was there a match? Hell to the nana. There was no match. 
Now, everybody in the family allegedly was fingerprinted, except for Suzanne. Suzanne, the mama's girl, refused to be fingerprinted. Dun, 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 dun. Now, Suzanne said that the one thing that made her convinced that her father had done this was the note. So did Suzanne print the note off? So they had a computer specialist to come and to do an audit of the computer to pull off records. Now, as you all know, when you delete records off of a computer, they are not gone. What is gone off of the computer is the space that the document that you had in its place. If that doc, if that space on that computer is not full, then they can go back and pull anything on that computer. So if you decide that you want to do something, bitch, and you got your computer all involved in it, and you want to get rid of it, you make sure you load that computer up with all kinds of nursery rhymes and Christmas carols, okay? Because what you want to do is take that space of that deleted document and get rid of it. <laughs> Just a note for all of y'all out there that did not did not know, okay? Okay. So they had someone to go back and look at the computer. When they pulled the church computer, there was nothing on the church computer. Just some 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 searches, computer searches on how to uh, drown in a bathtub, um what medicines would leave one on uncom- you know what I'm saying? On oh, this these, these were things that was on the pastor's computer. Now, General Lou said just because it was on daddy's computer didn't mean that daddy was doing the searches. Could have been mom because mom was asocidal. Okay, she was asocidal. But Suzanne said mom didn't even know about the computer. She didn't know how to use it. She was old school. And so mom didn't do the searches. But one day, one of the investigators remembered seeing a computer in the home he then got a subpoena okay to go in and a warrant to go and check the home again and they snatched up that computer which was with jenna lou and her husband allegedly so they go and get the computer they pull up all the deleted files those files that you think are gone and what cow there was the note now the note although mama sharon had three daughters the note was only addressed to one why would a mother of three who is writing a a societal note only address one child and then sign it love all of you so they took the note and they began to look at it. They saw that the spacing was the same. The comma it was in the wrong spot. The date was incorrect. They found all of those things that was incorrect. But Jenna Lou said, Mm-mm. that don't prove anything. Mama had a problem. So after 15 years, okay, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. So as the father went to trial, a jury found him guilty and he went to jail. While in jail, he got cancer of the spine and he died in the prison. Didn't even get to do all this life term, he, you know, he had cancer. Jenna Lou indicated to Suzanne that she watched her father die. Suzanne told Jenna Lou, I tried to see him, but he refused me. I even sent him children, um, pictures of my his grandchildren and he would send them back. Jenna Lou said he was very disappointed and angry with you. And so was I. She says that 
to she, Jenna Lou says to Suzanne that she has her mother's medical records and that if she had the opportunity to see what was in the medical records, that Suzanne would change her mind about her father's guilt. The two of them meet. After 15 years, they're both angry with one another, but really ready to now have the conversation. Jenna Lou indicated that her father made her promise that he would not, okay, he would not talk to her because she was no longer his daughter. And so she did not have an opportunity to say anything to her father for 10 years. He was in jail for 10 years before he died away from cancer. Now, Jenna Lou indicated that she came into town um, to see her father. And by the time she had got there, he was already gone. But that his wishes was that she not tell Suzanne. But I'm saying, where's the other sister? Now, Jenna Lou indicates that on the day of her mother's death, she lost her, her, father, her father, her mother, and her sisters. And so while Danielle has not spoken publicly, it appears that Danielle must have thought that the father was doing the same thing because why would she say she lost her sisters? Jenna Lou, and when Jenna Lou and Suzanne got together, she convinced her sister that she was wrong. She said, well, dad had 10 years to tell me, to get it right and tell me what happened. And she said, he didn't want you to know because he was disappointed in you. Now, this is Suzanne. God bless her mouth. God, don't, don't pay attention to the mouth. Do y'all need me to cover the mouth up? Okay, let me cover up that mouth for y'all. There we go. So, so this is Suzanne. <laughs> y'all know I can't do this without throwing a little bit of shade, okay? But God bless that thing right there, okay? Because we're going to back this thing up. Girl, that's looking bad. Let me back this thing up. Girl, your mouth is, ooh, back that thing up. Back that thing up. Okay, we got to cover that up. So, oops. Draw my glasses. Wait a minute. Draw my glasses, y'all. Hold on. Can I get my glasses? Where did I to? Hold on, y'all. Do I got it? Just one second. Got it. So let's handle this dispute. So Jenna Lou indicates that they are at war with one another. Okay. And this is Suzanne. Suzanne is the one who helped convict her father. Jenna Lou indicated that when Suzanne got that mouth right there up on the stand, that she knew that the jury was swayed. Okay? She knew the jury was swayed, and she knew that her father was going to be convicted. She said, how can you do something like this to your father? Now, if you all went and listened to the podcast, you will hear that the father made many different um, scenarios, situations, and stories up, in my opinion. And so, while I want to believe that old Bill didn't do this, in my opinion, all roads lead to Bill. But I want to get your opinion about it because Jenna Lou seems to think that her father could not have done this because her mother had already shown signs of depression and of being a societal. Now, Jenna Lou, when asked the question on whether or not her mother sleepwalked like her father indicated in the court records that she did, Nobody could recall that she was sleepwalking, that she was ever a sleepwalker. But the father was making up all kinds of stuff, okay? And so the sisters come together after 15 years. And at the end of the episode, Suzanne now doubts 
Suzanne now is convinced that all those years back in 1999, I believe it was. Let me make sure I get that date together. Oh, God. May 14th of 1999, Suzanne is now doubting herself. So I ask you, is the father guilty or not guilty? Was the Supreme Court of the state of South Dakota correct in supporting the conviction of William Guthrie. So I'm going to open up the line. You all can come on to the line. Let me see if I can get this on here. Okay. And let me know. Who did it? Which sister is right? Is it Jenna Lou? Or is it Suzanne? Okay, so I'm going to look through the comments and you all tell me who you believe is right. Which sister is right in this case? And where the fuck is Danielle? Why had to she weighed in on this issue? Is she still estranged from her sweet old sisters? Okay. So the question is, let me put it in here. Let me see if I can do it here. Hold on for a second. Because I see Mary saying stay on track. So that means people's all over the place. <laughs> so let me see. Let's see if we could get that banner up there. Let's see. If you believe that Jenna Lou is right, type a one in the comment section. I didn't know. Good point, Madonna. So it seems like everybody, okay, so EJ says, Suzanne, Danielle probably is hiding from embarrassment. Dad is guilty. Team Suzanne, guilty to Suzanne. To, to, um, Suzanne. Okay, the Perch sister is right. <laughs> Okay. 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 So you all believe that the husband did it. Okay, I do too. So I believe that he did it because despite what Jenna Lou believes, his story changed too much. And one thing about the truth is the truth does not need defending, in my opinion. I don't believe that the father 
was even attempting to pull the mother from the tub because when the neighbors came in and the EMTs and everybody observed him, he was dry. He indicated that he was impotent and that he loved his wife. Yet and still he had a mistress that he was seeing to the point where she had to drop him herself. And I do believe that he wanted to find a way out of this relationship. Now, Suzanne, at the end of the episode, it indicated that, you know, you believe that your mom was depressed and all that kind of stuff based on what your sister Jenna Lou said. And I know that you, the two of you all have been estranged from one another. And after 15 years, you probably really do want to repair the relationship with her. But why are you faulty and doubt now? After all that time. So I'm going to put in the banner. I believe daddy did it. I believe based on the preponderance of the evidence that daddy did it. The two of these sisters now, they are indicating, are talking to one another and that they're getting along and trying to um, get their relationship back. But they will never, ever be whole again. Never be whole again. Why this picture came up for them? I don't believe that this picture is them. Let me take this deck on picture deck. This may be somebody else, mom and daddy. Okay, there they go. I believe that, you know, oftentimes you, you find yourself in a relationship trying to hang on when you need to just walk away. But I'm sure as a pastor's wife, she probably never believed that he would do something like this. I never believe in a million years. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So you all did not click the link. So what I attempted to do was to open up the phone lines because I think that that's what y'all like. I think that you all are older seasoned women and you don't want to come on the screen. I don't know why, but you don't. So what I'm going to do with the next one is that we're going to do phone dialings. I had so much going on today. I didn't have time to, um, <laughs> I absolutely did not have time to hook up the phone lines and all of that. Cause you know, oh, I'm not that great, but thank you all so much for participating in this mystery. We're going to be doing some other mysteries as well. And, um, I'm hoping that this is something that you all like comment and share i'm hoping you hit that that thumbs up button when you came in but let me know down in the comment section what you think i can do to improve this um for you all did you like the podcast just let me know even y'all that don't usually comment let me know down in the comment section because your feedback is extremely important to me i say rest in peace to both um bill and to sharon and I'm praying that the sisters um, actually look at this and see what we thought about it. Not to cause them to be scratching at each other again, but just to get a different perspective um, on, on what the evidence shows. And I know Jenna Lou is probably going to always be 
a daddy's girl. Oh, I you. And think very fondly of her father. But sometimes we have to face reality and the facts. And facts don't lie. They just don't. At the end of this episode, they indicated that if there was not forensics, they had not stepped their game up in 1999 with how they, you know, um, do the forensic science and so all of that kind of stuff. They indicated that Bill without forensics, would have been walking away a free man. Absolutely free. Thank God for forensic science. Thank God for DNA. Thank God for fingerprinting. Thank God for all of that. Now, one of the things that did shock me, okay, I got to live with, leave with this cliff note, that I want you all to think about as well is that Suzanne never gave a, her fingerprints. Never allowed them to fingerprint her. Why? Was she the one that produced that cotton freaking um, a societal note? Was it her? Jenna Lou asked her. She said, everybody got fingerprinted but you. She said, I got fingerprinted. You know what Suzanne said? I would have allowed them to fingerprint me. As long as the facts there, you don't have to add anything else. You just don't. She never had to add anything else in this. She wasn't able to get a confession out of her father. But I did kind of look at that and think, hmm, because she indicated that it was the note for her. She said it was the note for me. But you never got fingerprinted to rule your, your fingerprints off of that note. I got a feeling, honey, and this is just a feeling, just my opinion. That if they were to do the analysis of her fingerprints now, bitch, it just might be a match. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm hoping you all found this interesting. Let me see. Okay, side eye. Who worries about a shower or would want to take a chance to be found naked if they were trying to? Okay, absolutely. And... Why would she be naked in there? And, um, you know, and she'd been fat shamed by her husband. I would have if they asked me, but I was eliminated. Is this a damn system? Who is Patricia? Is this one of the damn sisters? Okay, do you want to come on? Is this a sister? But it says Patricia. And the sister name wasn't Patricia. It was Suzanne. Okay, so who is this? Bitch. Yes, Randy. <laughs> okay, okay, because I was like, who the hell? Deidre said, I'm scared. <laughs> now, we very well may have family members. I have mentioned that there have been family members who have been in my comments, okay? Okay, everybody getting weird out. She said, I, I think, that's what Mary said. I think she's just making a statement. But the sister never said that, though. 
This was never said in any of the shows. She said, I would if they asked me, but I was eliminated. Okay, the sister never said that. She wasn't eliminated. She was not eliminated out of the equation. They wanted her fingerprints. That is weird. That's very weird. But what a great way to go out. <laughs> With y'all witted the hell out. I love y'all. Thank you all so much. For being here. Um, what did you say? Okay. Okay. All right, Patricia. Okay. Patricia getting a side eye. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Love y'all.